Now we're going to have a conversation with Zanzi, who is not a tanky, which makes me very happy. So let's get in. Let's do it. Let's have a conversation with Zanzi. Okay? I'm knocking on the whereby, Zanzi. No tanky doomcock. Get tanky doomcock off my timeline. Tanky doomcock is a genocide denier. We're going to... Tomorrow, when the video comes out, you'll see what I'm talking about. You'll, you'll fucking see. Let me check in on YouTube chat while we wait. Hello, everyone in YouTube chat. Much love to you. All your best friends are tankies? I doubt that. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, you're muted and whereby, just to let you know straight away. Okay, do you want me to be on whereby voice? Is that the easiest way to do this? Whereby voice is the easiest way. For All me right, let's do it. Let's do it. Let me love just bring you. you up on the screen. Here we go. Here we go. Everyone say hello to Zanzi and hello, Zanzi's community. Hello, everyone. Hello, my friend. Okay. Say, everyone say hello. Let's wave into the camera. We can pretend we're now back to back, yeah. like we're in the trench. Wait, hold on. Back. I can switch it so that we're, wait, hold on. Now, now I, it looks like wait. we're properly talking to each other. There we go. Wait, wait, is, is there, oh my God, I did not, I. You can move I them. I just learned something. Yeah. I just learned something. You can, oh. learn, you can move it in, in whereby. I know, it's cool, isn't it? I, and that is pure aesthetic, uh, but it's just giving me so much joy. Yeah. You got it's fishies. The smallest <laughs> Hi, fishies. Hi, Zanzi's fishies. So this is Sonny. This is Sonny Bill. And this is Williams. Th okay. Those are the most Irish names for fish I've ever heard in my entire life. I hope that doesn't offend you, but that is adorably <laughs> Irish fish naming conventions. I named them watching the World Cup. Sonny Bill Williams is a New Zealand winger. Really? Yeah. Still, it's the choice. It's the choice in name that's mat that matters. And I think what makes it better is they're not even my fish. They're my um. They, they came with the house. Oh wow! <laughs> Listen. Uh, when I when I moved in. Oh um, shut in... up, Grime Dango! Somebody in my chat's calling me a dumb American. Oh shut! You're watching a dumb American, so you know what? <laughs> it's infectious. It is. I know, it's 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 just uh, it, you've got Americanisms in my head at the moment now because it's um like this morning I had to wait like four or five hours for somebody from the county council to come by to unclog the pipes because um the part of the city I'm living in is very old like built before the founding of your country old um I think maybe 1320 was when the part of the city I'm in was um built so the pipes we're using are about 250 years old so they clog every time there's rain holy shit I I'm pretty sure you might have some sort of like um like eldritch beings living in those pipes <laughs> like holy shit <laughs> look as they can fight the fairies for the fucking territory okay <laughs> Yeah, oh, someone in my chat, uh, Grime Dango, says, uh, if that was America, that would be lead. That would be made of lead. Yeah, true. Um, I, I, it, it's, not lead. You see, see, here's the thing. Um, like uh, Americans, the people who built this place, the British also don't believe in looking after their citizens. True. So the majority of our water network was built in the mid 1800s is mostly copper and lead based. And for whatever reason, the Irish government is just, uh, it's, it, it, let me in a very quick nutshell, just like introduce you to a company called Irish Water, that what they basically did was they installed water meters and then started charging people for water. And how they justified the charge was, they said that we need to raise funds to fix the piping so that we can provide you fresh water. And I was like, wait, aren't you supposed to provide the service before you charge people for it? No, no, that would be very sensical. We need to do things. Profit has to be generated first in, in this in this wonderful system that we live in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to, I, I'm I'm very quickly ha going to have to adjust my stream in just settings because my okay. stream just went nah. Oh, no. Um, I, I bring it down to 1300 kilobits per second. Um, this is this is one of the problems because, um, uh, what is this? Oh, no, I, ah, there, there we go. Now it started streaming again. Um, I wasn't I wasn't quick enough to change the ingest server. I'm currently here's the weird thing about when you're streaming in Europe. Mm -hmm. I have like eight hundred different services to stream into. I'm streaming into Germany at the moment because the closest one is London. And well, like us Irish, we have a long and proud tradition of not relying on London for anything. Fair, completely reasonable. That is one of the most reasonable things. I would also not rely on London for anything. Um, so yeah. 
uh sick well i hope that the ingest works i had some streaming issues of my own um i always oh, tell yuck. people the entirety of all internet technology is basically uh gum paper clips um plastic straws and um occasionally a little bit of twine and that basically um basically makes up everything and and it can fall apart at any moment it can fall apart drastically at any moment or it will miraculously somehow uphold an a, a a parade of of strange content marching over it it's it's the internet is a mess is is the is the rundown of that so i, I feel you on that we always have some issues but, oh yeah and yeah. and the the weirdest thing about the internet as well is because it shouldn't work like oh, it, it shouldn't. it's a cop together mess of just random bits of service scattered here and there um it, it shouldn't work but it does um, now it, it works in our favor because it's almost impossible to then regulate and control the damn thing, meaning that it's provided somewhat of a wild west. Um, so it's it's very difficult to commodify, um, which is why you tend to get like um like anarchism is alive and well on the web, where you've a lot of like open source, you've a lot of like um free software, um like the the project of just like mutual aid of just like sharing things very alive and well on the internet because of how decentralized the entire uh, system is. So like it, it's it's a beautiful example of how this shit's possible in the modern age, and that something can withstand capitalism trying to lasso it absolutely it's really funny because i actually had this um this conversation with two of my partners uh over the last couple of days about world of warcraft um as you probably know the new world of warcraft expansion or maybe you don't but um but world of warcraft's new expansion came out and in attempting to introduce new people um to the game i realized that World of Warcraft is one of the best examples of a of, of mutual aid that you can possibly imagine. Basically, Blizzard has like there are entire portions of the game that have been utterly neglected on by the corporation that owns and makes profit of the game and out of out of nothing else but love for the world of Warcraft, nothing else. A massive add-on community has kept the game going for 20 years. And with add-ons, the game is eminently playable. It's Once you get your add-ons set up, now it's a mess because you have to download them from 100 different people who are all working together in these weird communities. And there are facets of this community that exist for no other reason than to organize different parts of that community. So, for example, there's like an app, an app, uh, there's a, uh, an app called Wow Up that all it does is organize and serve as a central point for coordinating other add-ons. And it's just like, yeah, if you want to understand how mutual aid works and how the, the like, how, and, and when I say that I believe that humans fundamentally like to get along and work together and, and take care of one another, look at the fucking wow add-on community, which World of Warcraft, World of Warcraft in its basic state is literally not playable. Some of the some of the the top end content is not doable without add-ons and blizzard knows that blizzard knows <laughs> and they don't design it to make it workable it's only playable the most the the content that their developers put some of the most work into making work they lean entirely on the add-on community to make that accessible and it's just like oh my god if you don't believe that humans want to work together to preserve things that they like and love, that's a sign of it. Just a bunch of random people, yeah. most of them not making money. Some of them have like a Patreon independently for their add-on and they're able to make it work from that. It's it's so interesting. Oh yeah, true. Also, AST in my chat brings up that before the introduction of individual loot in WoW, which is a really WoW, like you, I don't, I can't yeah. explain it fully, but there was uh, all kinds of distribution models, loot distribution models that arose and various guilds were operating on completely different internal economies based on how you would distribute loot. It was, it's actually yeah, amazing. I, There's entire economic theories. That, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's so wild. Uh, my sister got higher into the gilding, uh, the gilding, the the guild and the raiding, kind of like the dungeons than myself. I'm a solo player, so that game was not conducive to my gaming habits. But um, it, th there's a word for it, but I just can't remember off the top of my head. Where exactly like you said, the game is unplayable if you don't have all of these add-ons and things. But the weird thing is because like the game you play and the game they make aren't the same thing because what you end up playing has all of these extra layers of mods that are yes. just kind of like essential. Like 
can you imagine trying to convince a WoW player now to play without a quest helper? It, it, just, oh, it wouldn't be possible. Yeah, yeah, it'd be it's it's nightmarish. Like or or a UI mod down to yeah. the UI of the game is literally not conducive to uh to being able to actually play the game. Yeah, yeah, Gr Grime Dango says, "Yeah, that was pretty much my experience." Grime Dango's new to WoW and has joined me um in playing WoW and it's just been like you need to you absolutely have to have a UI mod. And it's just like, "What? How do you have a game that is a mil a game that's making millions of dollars for Blizzard that be because of abuses of copyright law, functionally, yeah. if you really think about it, that only works if you rely on third-party apps to make it work. Oh, it's just, it's so ridiculous. It's so and ridiculous. Because what's really annoying about it is because, like, this, this is a really good example of, like, emergent phenomena. Because you know how all of these, like, universally, like, used apps, like, like the most obvious one that I can think of off the top of my head is um, the, I can't remember the name of it, but it basically just converts all of your bag slots into just one square. Uh, yeah, you can tell on was one of them. And there now go, there's, yeah. like, a hundred of them. But yeah, yeah. you can tell probably. somebody just sat down somewhere and said to themselves, I'm sick of having to press shift and then click. I'd rather just click and then have everything open. So he did that and then probably went into his guild and said, hey, look at this. This is cool. And they all went, oh, I want that. And then it just spur uh, spread by word of mouth. And then somebody in Blizzard, uh, Windivish, incorporated into the game and then just kind of argued it's a game feature now. Um, <sighs> where it's it's kind of that it, i actually went on a different tangent but the point that i'm trying to get at is more along the lines of that a lot of it is because somebody like, like modders are uh, like a strange bunch because they're just they're not happy with what they're given but that's a good thing to them and, and i love that about them because they constantly want to tweak and play with what they have and then they share that which just shows that there's something about the human condition where we always like to just there's there's the creative transformative property of just the human condition that we always want to do something with what we've got and in something like an mmo that has millions and millions of players um stuff that's really useful gets around so a load of people start downloading it until it gets to the point where um, it's not that you need the download to play the game. It's you need the download to play the game with other people because they'll expect yes. you to have it. Yeah, exactly. It's it's really wild. And like, there's one. Oh, there's there's. Oh God, there's so much. There's so many examples of this that I could that I could even talk about. But one thing, and I think this is like super good. I I feel like you're gonna love this little anecdote, this little World of Warcraft related <laughs> anecdote that we're on this, and it touches on a lot of the politics stuff that we talk about. The best example of this, I think, is a, a add-on called DBM. Um, WoW fans will know what I'm talking about. People who aren't a part of WoW won't understand, but I'm going to explain it. DBM is called Deadly Boss Mods. And um, at first, what it started as was a pretty small add-on that was like, okay, so you're raiding, right? You're in a raid, you're in a dungeon, you're doing stuff with other players. And there were bosses in the game that were really tough to beat. And so what hmm. Deadly Boss Mods would do, hence why it's called Deadly Boss Mods, is it would, the Deadly Boss, it would give you a special, this add-on would give you a special notification for attacks that are likely to kill the entire raid. So, for example, say that you're fighting a giant, and at one point he does a slam, and you have to jump in order to avoid the slam, it will go, jump, and it'll tell everyone on the screen at the same exact time, jump, 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 and so that they don't die, and so you don't clear the, um, so you don't, you know, wipe the raid. Well... At this point in time, Deadly Boss Mods has literally become necessary for raiding. You cannot raid without DBM. There is no possible way you would know the mechanics. And even Blizzard's attempts to make like abilities more um, visible um, haven't really succeeded in the same way. Now, there are other yeah. MMOs out there that have perfectly fine time where you don't need an add-on like this. I mean... The best example is probably Final Fantasy XIV. In Final Fantasy XIV, abilities are very, very clearly telegraphed, so players can look for those cues and then, you know, go from there. WoW does not have this to the same degree. Not even close. So DBM is essential. And what ended up happening is somewhere through the last expansion of WoW, which was known as Battle for Azeroth, BFA, um, there was a post that went out on the DBM creator uh his his patreon and he was like listen everyone i hate to tell you this 
I need to stop making DBM. Um, I have been battling a jaw infection for months. Oh, yuck. Um, and um, I just don't have the money to keep paying for medicine. I don't have the time to keep doing this. Um, and there was a crisis, like a genuine existential crisis in the WoW community because all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, if, if yeah. DBM goes away, holy fucking shit. Like, we're not going to be able to raid anymore. Like, we're going to have to do, like, what the fuck are we going to do? And then, you know, as people dug into it more, they found out that the DBM guy has been a one-person team programming on a <laughs> shitty old computer for, like, 15 years. He's been keeping this incredibly exhaustive mod where he would go on raids and he would document all the abilities and plug them into the mod. Um, and he was buying, he was literally buying fish antibiotics to take care of his because he had no health insurance because he was a, a, a contractor in the u.s i know it's it's wild it's absolutely stunning yeah. and so once that happened once it found once it was found out that this happened of course there was a like a community-led giant fundraiser and now he's doing as far as i understand it the last i checked in he was doing great but tons of people like our guild literally put up uh we had a guild command where every single time you would um log in the guild would tell you to go to his um gofundme to help raise money because our guild would not be able to function without dbm um and it was like it got to the point where literally like blizzard found got somebody got in contact with blizzard and blizzard sent him like a pallet of of stuff that was like like basically the entire blizzard store of wow products including a brand new computer wow themed like like set up so he has a whole battle station now that's a completely wow theme that was gifted to him by <laughs> blizzard which is nothing if you really yes he's doing fine now atona no aji last i checked he, like yeah as far as i know I, I, that was my next question is he okay yeah he's doing fine now as far as i know i i followed the, this for a while um you know but obviously i've drifted away from wow over the last year and now i'm just reconnecting so i haven't updated like in the last few weeks but as of last year when he said he was fine he got his thing taken care of them the fundraiser got him the treatment he needed and he was he was doing well and he also hired on some help which is great mm. um but like yeah it's just absolutely wild um the degree to which like in america our the way that we set up these systems these games these products are totally they're, the way that we monetize them, the way that we build the economy around them is completely um, alien to how they actually run. When in truth, these things are all mass community projects. Every single popular game you can think of, with very few exceptions, are these huge community systems with people coming up with yeah. suggestions and ideas and, and all these things. And there's all these people contributing to it. And, and you know, in a certain way, thank God that those people exist. Thank God the people who actually care to make things, to keep building, do that. Because if it was on the hands of just the corporations, we wouldn't have shit. We wouldn't have you'd shit. Bar you'd barely have the game. Yeah, you wouldn't and even have the game. Yeah. WoW would be, un WoW would literally be inaccess completely inaccessible um, yeah. in the way that we know it. Like, the, the thrill of winning uh, a mythic raid, the hardest content in the game, would not exist it would be genuinely impossible for uh, if it wasn't for DBM. DBM is the key that this guy's efforts, this one guy, and, and also the feedback of his own community, because of course he gets feedback on certain things like changing and tweaks and whatever, but this guy and his community is the key that unlocks some of the most thrilling experiences you can have in a video game of this 25 people all coordinating this crazy dance of fighting an incredibly difficult boss that requires ridiculous precision and practice on everyone's part communication from the leader of the healing squad the leader of the dps squad the yeah. leader of the tanks all people communicating in chat to defeat this incredibly difficult enemy only possible because of one because of dbm and that is DBM has never been a part of the monetization structure of WoW. Those billions of dollars that, that Blizzard has scraped in over the years from WoW, from subscriptions, from gifts, from all kinds of shit, um, not possible without the literal willingness of people to engage in mutual aid. And 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 that now you can start to see where uh, some of my my political leanings come from, <coughs> some of the observations that inform my political leanings. Yeah.
And because like t- two things, first of all, just a little bit of a joke. Highest level I ever gotten wow was forty nine. So everything you've said, I might as well still be in the starter zone. Oh. I've no idea what a mythic raid is. I, I I've I've heard about them. I've I've wandered into these odd little open space areas where random big dragon with its skull and crossbones for a level just decides it's having it's using me as a toothpick. <laughs> um, it, I, like I've heard about these things, yeah. but it it, mi- it might as well be a new expansion pack to me. That's available only to people who aren't literally me. Uh, secondly, um, what it does is it completely puts a hole in the argument you constantly hear from it, like especially libertarians, I feel like ANCAPs, where yeah. it's the like without capitalism, you wouldn't have innovation. And I think they, I, they fundamentally misunderstand one of the key aspects of economic development, which is incentive is what drives things, not capitalism. Capitalism, capitalism yeah. just builds itself off of um, the exploitation of these incentive structures. Um, if there's something in it for you, then you're going to do it. There's your incentive. You can play with those incentive structures. Mm-hmm. Um, we've constantly seen that social dynamics and kind of like just like 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 being like you can get a lot out of being the one who maintains that stuff. Oh, absolutely. And that's an incentive in itself. So like like how like. I mean, for God's sake, like we stream and we barely get, um, we would barely get compensated in what would be um, what our governments consider our minimum wages for our labor. Not even close. Yeah, I'm not even close but, to that. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's not the economics of why, no, sorry, it is the economics. It's not the literal monetary value that, it, that does it. It's the incentive structures. Mm-hmm. We get something out of it. And everyone watching, you're getting something out of this. Mm-hmm. And that fundamentally is the hole in the capitalist argument where they say there'd be no innovation. I'm like, no, innovation will constantly happen because there's incentives to. It's, it's literally that simple. There's incentive to innovate. Yeah. And how I always put it down to is because, like you said, like modding, explain modding yeah to a capitalist because it doesn't make sense explain, it's entirely for yeah, profit explain modding both ter- both versions of the term modding like modding games or moderating communities there's i mean True. literally there are entire spaces of the internet that don't make any sense under capitalist uh under like capitalist interpretations and he- here's one of the things that i think that people that like a lot of ancaps like trip over which is this idea that like when they hear the word incentive the only thing they can think of is money because yeah, to them that's all they can hear. money is the only thing but but the fact of the matter is that first of all money literally can't buy everything Um, But in our system, we've set it up such that most of the time, money, not having money locks you out of most of the incentives that you would otherwise get from doing things. So it actually does the opposite of what they're saying. Because if you're not able to gather money, if you're not interested in in pursuing something that that is highly profitable within a very specific, like a very, very thin way that we determine what's profitable... Um, then you're not allowed to reap the actual benefits of, I mean, think of it like this. I mean, how much of, of like, like how many restaurants, for example, are only made possible because of the fact that they have live music? How many bars are, uh oh, oh, I think we lost you. Are you still there, Zanzi? Oh, we lost Zanzi. Oh, rip internet problems. Um, it's okay. We'll, we'll reconnect. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll wait until he comes back. It's all right. Yeah. What if more capitalism? Yeah, it's ridiculous here. I'll take this opportunity to check in with YouTube chat. Hi, YouTube chat. How are you doing? YouTube chat. My dad always says money can't buy happiness, but I'd rather cry in a Ferrari than on a bike. I mean, that's, that's the way that it works, right? That's the mentality. That's the mentality that capitalism pushes is that like, Hey, you can't buy happiness, but a lot of times Here's the thing. Money can't buy you happiness, but not having money. I'm I'm back. Yay. I was just checking my, my YouTube chat. Fell hi, YouTube my chat. internet absolutely fell apart there. Um, hi. Oh, thank you. There. All right. All right, YouTube. I'm heading back to the conversation. All right. I check in in YouTube chat from time to time. Um, oh, lovely. But yeah. Um, yeah. So what I was saying is basically like, I, like, capitalism often stifles innovation because it basically says the only thing the only way we can the only carrot we can provide you is money and things that don't necessarily make a whole lot of money despite providing value like say live music at a bar which is one of the biggest things that gets people to go hang out at bars like i mean uh last last uh 
this was like last year, I went on a trip to, to Texas with my partner and damn near every restaurant that we went to had live music. And like, and it's from random nobody bands that are not famous, that aren't making a whole <coughs> lot of money. They're not selling platinum albums. They're just local musicians who play music and people love that shit. And there's not really much of a capitalist incentive there unless you're playing at like the highest end restaurant in town and they actually pay like a fee. But that usually doesn't happen. So it's like so much of our economy is built on these things that are completely taken for granted. I mean, another thing like that in my experience that's like this um, was, you know, uh, writing. When I was a writer, people were always like, oh, like, you know, oh, writing, like, oh, what do you do? Write books or something? I'm like, no, I write text on websites. I write, I mean, sometimes I wrote for books and stuff, but it was like, usually what I'm writing for is stuff to fill websites because every website needs to have a fuckload of text on it and nobody thinks about that shit. Yeah. And the way that it is right now is that that work is relegated to extremely low paid people who have to do a, an incredible amount of writing um, at almost at almost no rates because it's taken for granted. Like so much in our society is taken for granted in the name of pr of producing profitable top level products like World of Warcraft, where oh you need to pay your subscription to World of Warcraft and none of it gets shared with anybody else. So this whole there's all these assumptions that bandy about in America in the general American dialogue, specifically in certain spaces, specifically in really conservative quote-unquote libertarian spaces about, oh, like, you know, yeah, you know, if you raise the pay rate, it wouldn't be profitable. It's like, oh, it wouldn't be profitable. Really? You really think that if you didn't give some share of the shit that you do, that you wouldn't have still millions of dollars funneling into a company like Activision Blizzard? It's unbelievable. Like, these the, the people don't understand, and we're... It, to be fair, it's because we're locked out of it, but people don't understand the level of exploitation that goes on to justify corporate corporate structure in America. When in reality, most of the things that we interact with are mosaics of cooperation, like incredible yeah. cooperation. Yeah. So. And because it, because it, I, I was actually saying this to a comrade earlier. Like I, I, I tried having a left thinking this morning, but. Um, I ended up having to cancel it because um, I needed to get the fucking drains cleaned. Yeah. But um, we were but we were talking about the state of like the political zeitgeist in the US. And um, I joked, but I, but I mean it, we're like that. The US probably needs two revolutions. You need a sock dem revolution just to get out of the grips of like just the fascist right wing. Because like, like right now, it's like, like you're so far right wing that the left wing is it's not like you're in a position where you can't even imagine what that looks like and but i when i say ye i mean like this society at whole like, like for, for god's sake you can't even imagine what socialized healthcare looks like right yeah. now you're still having that argument at, at state level which is why i'm saying like in terms of maybe cultural revolution you probably need two of them for god's sake and that's that's the worry that i see a lot of mls have where that we acknowledge the first revolution but then we're terrified that people are not going to want the second one because they'll be happy with the, the, they'll be happy with the incremental gains they got. Yeah. Um, they, they, that we can get into that conversation in in full later if you yeah, want. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, is, like the way I look at it, and the way that I look at it is that I think that what we're going to see, and and I hope that we're going to see this, is not just a single like I don't know. I think there's this this um. I think there's a way of of simplifying. Um, and boiling down history to something that doesn't really resemble what probably was a little more accurate. Like, I mean, there are confluences of forces that go on. I don't think that we will see like a single R like revolution yeah. kind of thing. What I think we're likely to see is, um, and I think this is happening right now, is like hundreds of industries, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of thousands of people coming to similar conclusions um, like, like, and, and changing their space, like changing their community or changing their company or changing their, their general space that they live in or their city or whatever. And I think that is often what we see, um, like sort of t like this, this spread outward and, and affect other people. And these sort of like drops that create r ripples, because I, I, I don't imagine like, I, like it's very obvious, especially now, especially with this, this 
and and here in the states i i dread to talk about covid at all because it seriously makes me um stressed right now looking yeah. at all the numbers and everything that's happening um but at the same time it's it's absolutely true that that covid is putting the the fallout from covid has put an un an incredible amount of pressure across the board on on everyone and what that means is that there are tons and tons and tons of people trying to figure out and identify what the hell is causing this pressure how do we survive in the face of this pressure and what do we do to make it not happen again and so i think that like there are going to be like a lot of these m miniature revolutions these these cultural changes that can be as long as we do them as long as we got the right ideas we can influence these things in different areas and people will adjust you know say like equity is like something we want to become the new thing and you focus on that and you put that in the hands of the people in in the gaming community and they figure out how to influence it there and you put it in the people in the automotive community you put it in the the people in the streaming community and each of these communities have their solutions of people that are motivated by the by the right ideas by these these better incentives than profit and you might see a world that changes and it could change who knows it could change rapidly um you know but i don't know i think sometimes there's this um there's this idea that there's just like a big switch that you flip and then everybody goes ah! and just goes and everything <laughs> blows up and then you have a new system or whatever and i don't think that that's usually um how that sort of thing happens you know what i mean um yeah that's that's the key thing like revolutions are not moments yeah. um like a revel this this is such a weird comparison to make but revolutions are like games you can't sum it up in a single event all you can do is try to synopsize the entire experience right um you, you probably won't even notice you're in one until afterwards um and one of the things that i will say is like that um it, it was only when i was like um the saturday was 100 years since a massacre that took place in dublin that was one of like the pivotal flashpoints of the irish war for independence and when i was reading through the documentation to kind of do that video um one thing occurred to me was that um we were fighting the largest empire the world had ever seen and within 10 years it had collapsed um at the time, nobody thought that would happen. And that's one piece of hope that I'll give ye. Um, the US is showing signs of collapse. Oh, um, I like, agree. As with an the, empire, the... like its imperialist empire is collapsing right now. Now, good or bad, I let ye decide. It's collapsing in China's favor. Ye can decide if that's good or bad. The good part is America's grip on the world is weakening. Oh, so for sure. there is an opportunity. Yeah. And I, I think perhaps uh like you know the bloom pill is that like uh we're more communicative with one another and we oh, have yeah. more tools to communicate with one another than ever before and it's actually if there was ever a time that a sort of international a global change of approach um could happen i feel like it's in the age of the internet where instantaneous communication with people across the globe is possible um, the internet, honestly, you know, uh, especially the, 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 you know, the free internet an internet that's not completely commodified, it gives me a lot of hope. Um, you know, it, it gives me this, this, like, there's this unanswered question of like, what happens when there isn't a two week delay between being able to communicate with people via letter that has to be carried physically across the ocean? Like what happened now? Yeah. We don't have to do that. We have cables that just go. I can send you, you're in Ireland. I can send you, I, we're talking in real time right now yeah. and pe like tons of people are watching us. That's absurd. That's wild. It's just like, oh shit, like, fuck. Like that's actually really, that is, there is a revolution right there that we don't think about yeah. because we grew up, you know, a lot of us grew up with this internet around. Like I, I was born like right at the cusp of the internet starting. And so I got to, you know, I had a childhood where we didn't really have internet and then all of a sudden we did. And it was like, whoa like all of a sudden i could talk to people all over the place and now it's just like i'm witnessing in real time like what can be achieved by connecting people who otherwise would have been unconnectable and that yeah. really blows my mind and it really does give me hope that is like my main bloom bloom fuel is this idea that it's like shit like we're actually connecting we're actually like like the human 
brain, the, the collective brain of humanity is coming mm. online, so to say. And it's like, whoa, what, what can we do? What will we be able to do? Or will we just drive ourselves nuts? <laughs> I don't know. I Twitter, know Twitter, Twitter leans me towards the like driving ourselves nuts like <laughs> sometimes. But... I, t t Twitter, I'm, I'm convinced that Twitter is for agitprop, not for conversation. Oh, hey. Um, I'm, you, it sounds like I'm, you've bought I'm starting. Code. I'm starting to adopt a, a kind of like a theory in my head that like if you're 10 words into a tweet and you're not shit posting or you're not monologuing, well, then what the fuck are you doing? Yeah, true. I mean, that's I mean, I, I, I talk to this about with my chat all the time. <laughs> Everybody knows the code. You probably know the code. I think you've been there a couple of times. I have my code for probably, Twitter. Yeah. And that's because I think that following that code and I always tell people this. It's not a moral code. It's not a punitive code. Oh, if no. you fuck it up, it's nothing about guilt. You don't need it. There's no, literally no guilt aspect. This is a user manual. Yeah, there we go. D&D &D, meme and cream promote and dunk. Um, there you go. You got him. Um, but yep. yeah, that code is, is a, is, is meant to just help you make sure you're using it right. You know what I mean? Like, Hey, you, I'm using Twitter effectively. Yeah. Nice. You yeah. know what I mean? And it, to, to comment on the point you're talking about like that, we live in like the information age of technology and about the, how that makes things incredible. It's because like, <clears throat> like, like my politics is like, I'm an old school, like 70, no. 18th century Republican that's like deep into my historical tradition. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the one of the questions that needed to be solved, and that was how do you get equitable representation for disparate groups that don't necessarily have each other's interests coded into their own perspectives? Mm -hmm. For instance, like trans people make up a fractional portion of the population, so their interests are not the majority interest. So how do you get the majority of cis people to care? That's why one of the arguments would be that, well, then you give kind of like a weighted um, like uh, opinion uh, towards trans representation in that conversation so that you can avoid a tyranny of the majority situation, that kind of situation. Because mm -hmm. here's the thing, you deserve rights, even if 80% of the population don't want to give them to you. True. So right there, we've acknowledged that it's not one person, one vote. It's weighted into the disparate interests that are attached to each other. So already we've acknowledged that there's a reason why you might want to have disparate representation. So the internet allows us the opportunity for the answer, a good answer to that question isn't, how about an electoral college? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the electoral yeah. college is, is a laughably unjust institution. Yeah. Like, I, I talk about this all the time. I've had a couple of debates about the, the electoral college. And what, I, what I've realized is that most people genuinely do not understand how it functions. And that's one of the biggest things. And, and teaching people, okay, yeah. what does it do? And then just asking them, does this thing do what you want it to do? And usually the answer is no, because I'm like, okay, so, you know, if you look at the electoral college, okay, so does the electoral college actually give a greater voice to um, people who would otherwise be unrepresented? And the answer is absolutely not. In fact, it erases the voice of people and, and, and essentially cordons all of the, 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 in this case, the unwanted voices into specific states where it can be controlled. It, it's, the, it's the opposite. And that's just how it's, it's structured like that. And it's yeah. funny because it's become such a um, polarizing issue just on its face. But when you ask people who support it, what is it, what is it supposed to do? Okay, well, you want to make sure that it's giving a voice to rural people. Is it giving a voice to rural people? No, it isn't. It isn't giving a voice to rural people. It's giving a voice to certain rural states, very specific rural states, which then become swing states, which then get all yeah. of the attention to the detriment of everybody else. And their voices aren't heard anywhere besides when it's election time. So it's not doing its job. It really, really is not doing its job. Um, yeah. Because yeah. here's here's the key thing. It's, it's The United States right now can't decide if it's um, a if it's a federation or if it's a nation it hasn't decided yet yeah, yeah. <clears throat> your president is it's a national institution yet it's federally decided so the the whole idea basically is along the lines of like that i'm like yeah but what about like these three states that have like poor representation and you're kind of like why does it matter the president is involved in foreign affairs why should your individual state matter it's a national affair it's not a federal affair it's a national it's they don't seem to have kind of gathered that point and then the second point is why is your president so damn powerful you're a federation right <laughs> well and that's the thing there's been this this is that is the split right like i mean uh, th that's the thing i don't know like if if we want to be if, if i want to go completely just like yeah. simplify it down 
right now we have a we don't have a struggle between Democrat and Republican parties. We have a, a, a struggle between a Republican party and a monarchist party, um, quite literally. Yeah. The Republicans, as we know them, are monarchists. They believe in, they say all the time that they believe in states' rights. They don't give a fuck about states' rights. They would be more than willing to give Trump all of the power in the world to literally make him a dictator um, if they could do so without getting themselves killed, which is basically what's happening right now. They're trying to push the buttons and see how far they can push their guy into a position of power unjustly without actually causing, you know, an uprising. Um, and it looks like, I don't know, it's not going so great on that front. I don't, I don't know what they're up to. They're struggling. But, um, but you know, that's basically what they're doing. And then we have the Democratic Party, which isn't Democratic at all. They don't push for any Democratic reforms. They push yeah. for Republican reforms. They push for representative reforms, um, not for anything that would resemble democracy like like or, or direct democracy. They push for reforms to a Republican system that's heavily, heavily corporatist. And so, like, again, we have a Republican Party and we have a monarchist party in the United States, but they just don't call themselves that at all. But that's really the, the ideological um, split right now on the in the mainstream. And then if you go beyond the mainstream, obviously it gets more uh, more complicated than that because you have a faction, a, a rising faction in the existing Democratic Party that is more democratic, yeah. that is looking for um, you know a, a a much more people focused approach. You have the the AOCs, the Ilan Omar, like the the squad, all these you know Bernie Sanders, these types of people who are rising up, and and like they are the leftist that we have in our actual government right now, which isn't all that left, but it, it's 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 really wild. It, but again, at the end of the day, they're going up against an autocratic party, a party that believes in placing all of the power in whoever their current chosen hierarchical leader is and right now it's trump um and i don't know i don't know where they're going to go from there because i feel like they i don't know my mind right now is torn when we're discussing american like like yeah current affairs that like um you know i feel like I'm, I'm torn between did they pull the trigger too early and they couldn't actually make it happen they couldn't make their their power grab actually fully happen and it's just kind of like they're slipping on the soap which is what it kind of feels like um, versus is this going to, is it going to all ignite on inauguration day? Is Trump going to keep pushing? I don't yeah. know. Yesterday it seemed like, I mean, he functionally conceded by saying like, oh, we're going to start letting the inauguration team do stuff. And then it's like, and then 10 minutes later he's tweeting, no, we're not conceding. We're not fucking conceding the election. So it's just like, what is going on? What are they even thinking? And I just, I don't know. It's dizzying. It's fucking dizzying. But yeah. Yeah. I, it's it, it, two things I want to say. The first of all is like that, like, I just want to put to bed one of the arguments that annoys the ever loving shit out of me because like I said, like I'm a Republican. Mm -hmm. So when I hear P when I hear Republicans argue like that, we're not a democracy, we're a republic. A republic is a form of representative democracy. Right. It's right. not a direct democracy, it's representative democracy. Republics are dem democracies. Let's just get that straight out of the way. For sure. The second one is um one thing that I think it, it's like it, this is almost gallows humor, but Jesus Christ, COVID saved your country. Um, without COVID, Trump was getting a second term. It's looking, it's looking that way now. Um, looking how how tight those margins were, um, I, I I'm starting to really believe that. I mean, <laughs> Where, it's so hard. I, the like... Democrats did not endear themselves to like. Um, I, I, I think, I think Trump got more votes this time than last time. I'm not entirely sure. Well, I don't really did, yeah. remember. Um, yeah. I think that's but, a hard, a hard, uh, I think that's a hard one to, to discuss, but it's like, I understand where you come from on that because it's like, on one hand, it's like, on one hand you have, you have the fact that like, it's only because of Donald Trump that we even had this disaster. So the disaster happening in this way instead yeah. of like a nuclear disaster or <clears throat> or a more an even more deadly disease than covid is like yeah imagine if like imagine if like um if like imagine if like covid 2 came next year in Donald Trump's second term where he didn't have to think about reelection at all like yeah. oh my god that would be such a mess um like that would be so bad right and then like um but then at the same time it's also like fuck like 
we can't it's almost impossible to actually figure out what this year would have looked like if it was a if it was not a covid year like it's perfect it's it seems like feasible or possible <coughs> that um some of the uh urgency that the democrats were able to like to pull on to push biden forward wouldn't have succeeded and maybe that would have resulted in a bernie or or even not a bernie but like a warren or something like that even though warren didn't really do all that great but you know what i mean like somebody different that wasn't yeah. biden that wasn't so milk toast at um at biden and and then of course like when you look at the senate races which is where it was like the, the the election wasn't really close in Donald Trump's favor as far as on the um on the federal level oh, like on the presidential yeah. level they've said it was it wasn't at all now the senate was the people who lost the dems who lost were largely the centrist milk toast dems in the senate so it's really hard to say it's actually like to, to the credit of the bernie people like which was i was a bernie person i just also accepted when bernie literally himself set, stepped down that we can't keep pursuing this you know what i yeah. mean um i said originally that a bernie would have been stronger against trump obviously i think a lot of us would have known would have said that and and the senate <laughs> results seem to be saying that as well which of course that means uh, that means we're stuck in a position where the Democrats are desperately going to suppress, are de des desperately going to oppose that. They don't want anybody to pay attention. Um, they definitely don't want to pay anybody to pay attention to the fact that it was the the corporatist Dems that lost their seats. That yeah. that the lefty Dems won. The leftier you are right now, the better it's selling to the people. They don't want us to recognize that, but it's to the favor of the left that that's the case because they now the narrative, the facts. The obvious facts are switching out of the favor of the corporate Dems, and the left can can use this to swing the politics left. It's just it, it's going to have to be, um, you know, it's going to have to be capitalized on, and that's why I'm very very excited to see that like uh, on on at least in the cultural in the, the the sort of halls of of culture, the left is take is making big strides, and I think that yeah. shows promise for our <clears throat> politics after this horrific crisis finally clears that we might actually be able to. Oh, there was actually I actually have literally on my tab up here, um, with the whereby an article that I was wanting to go over at some point today, um, <laughs> that was um. It's talking about like it was uh, Rachel Maddow talking about radical normalcy. And I'm just like, that is not selling anymore. You must realize that that's not selling. Everyone knows there is no going back to normal. And if they don't know it now, they're going to know it in January. They're going to know it once the winter yeah. with, the, with a, a, a literal monolith of COVID cases just ravaging the country. They're going to see that and go... <laughs> oh, um, yeah, that doesn't exist anymore. So the, the the Dems are really out of step with their messaging. They're totally in denial at this point. And I think that that provides an opportunity for the left to go, yeah, we recognize normal's not coming back. You all know it ain't coming back. Your job isn't coming back. You don't have money to pay for rent. What do we do about it? And here's the answer. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So we got off the point a little bit, but I, I just think that like, <laughs> When we talk about COVID, like, I don't know if it's as clear cut as saying like COVID saved it or anything like that, but what it has done is it certainly revealed, like, uh, I liked, I always liked, um, Sam Cedar's, uh, analogy, which is that COVID has been a barium test for all of the institutions, our political institutions yeah. in this nation. And we are seeing where all of the fa faults are. And if those of us who are plugged into politics can manage to communicate those faults to the, to the the people who listen to us or or broaden our audience and reach that get that to the people who can vote who can participate who can do mutual aid who can organize we actually have a shot at changing things but covid was the thing that covid the one thing that covid did do was reveal where the faults are and the cost yeah. was huge um and will still be huge um but you know we gotta just choose to make to to take advantage of the fact that it's revealed these flaws and make those clear to people and show them what we can actually do that would make make things better and prevent it from happening in the future. So, yeah. yeah.
Because uh, part, part of where I'm coming from, and um, like th- this, like I'm I'm outside of your politics, <clears throat> so I don't I don't have the the luxury of like the the zeitgeist of existing within the culture itself mm. to be like I don't even have your news cycle for God's sake. Um, I spend twenty minutes and I need to have a lie down. Um, <laughs> one of the things like Fair. there's two Me things that I think are incredibly important. Is the first thing is because, um. I have no way of backing this up. I've just heard this a few times mm-hmm. and I'm I'm inclined to believe it. You can strike it down if it's just wrong. Sure. The way the Democrats were entering the primaries going up against Trump, it was like they were content to take the opposition benches where they didn't actually want the presidency really. They just they wanted to lose while looking like they were doing well. I've heard that argument before where they weren't that like it, it's it it was I, I don't know how it was put to me, but it was along the lines of where like it's yeah. I'm not even convinced by my own argument, to be no, honest. No, I mean, I think um, I think there's some truth to that. I think what was happening, at, at least at the very top levels of the Republic, of the Democratic Party, is that there was a lack of urgency at the very beginning, in the primary specifically. Yeah. Um, before COVID had really taken off, there was, there, this is not the case for the voter base of the Democratic Party, as is seen by oh, yeah, just, just how intense yeah, it was. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Yeah. But on the upper level, in the upper level leadership, oh, of course, the Democrats yeah. were like, totally fine with just what they wanted was to just re reassert d- democratic establishment control which is why they were so willing to undercut their own um their own candidates even ones who were performing well in the name of yeah. of establishing of, of the establishment you know you see just ridiculous undercutting of of you know uh rashida talib of 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 ilan omar of of uh, aoc the, the squad members who were just constantly undercut uh, Bernie Sanders totally undercut, despite the fact that they are members of the Democratic Party and they did have a shot to win. A rational Democratic Party would have recognized, "Hey, wait a minute, these guys are winning for us. Yeah. We should put these on the." Can you imagine, like, a, can you imagine, like a, 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 a like a football team? You know, a football team that doesn't put its best players in because, like, yeah. they because they're they, afraid those players will do too good. It's like it's it's yeah. that's a problem. They, they should have identified have. the popular support and then tried to like. Uh, now, I don't agree with anything I'm about to say, but this is what they should have done if they were actually competent they should have recognized the popular support and then tried to use sanders as a means to infiltrate that populist base to reinforce the establishment itself by actually controlling that capital and then enriching their uh, ability to kind of like gain access to the middle class because yeah. then you would have them indebted to the idea that sanders's politics required the democrats that is what a competent democratic party would have done oh, absolutely but, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. what I what I'm gathering and like even like what you were saying kind of like reframed in my head where it's like the Democratic Party didn't want to win the presidency. They wanted to purge their party and argue the left lost it for them. Oh, it 100%. seemed like that was what they wanted to do. One hundred percent. And I would agree yeah. with you. And I think yeah. part of that is is the product of the uh the bipartisan nature of corporate interests in America. Um, yeah. is it that is the product of it because at the end yeah. of the game at the end of the day you have people who are giving an incredible amount of money to both parties in order to secure their influence in the party and to them who wins is not the main interest what matters is that they win the people who are funding these and i mean they really yeah. really are like when you look at 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 like oil interests in the united states and the fact that they play both parties really hard and to an incredible degree. I mean, we're talking millions upon millions of dollars that they're dumping into politics. It it totally, uh, it, it just totally fucks the uh, the the pol- political structure. And this is the sort of like um, hijacking of the political structure that is is so cons- you know that like that I feel like the people who or- originally set up our our government did not foresee like um sam cedar has done a, a, a couple of segments on this talking about uh not to, to refer to sam cedar again but i think his discussion on this is really good talking about how our system was never designed to, to have a false opposition party but that the democrats yeah. have increasingly become a false opposition party they're a party that's willing to shoot themselves in the foot because them winning could be bad for them as in the party itself not the members of the party but if the if they win but they lose all of the money that they get from corporate interests because they've pissed off those corporate interests they're out of the game that party is never going to compete again because money is so influential in our politics and the the struggle against getting money out of politics has been functionally lost in the united states what with um the uh 
Citizens United and all of these other similar things that allow corporate interests to just give unlimited funds. And this was not always the case. This had been re restricted in the past, um, but it's not anymore. And so what we have right now is we have a like a shadow oligarchy, which sounds really, really conspiratorial. Yeah. And I don't, I, I, I want to show people that that's, this, <clears throat> that this is verifiable. You can get information on how, on, to a certain degree, there's some that's never, that's never going to be revealed, but you can see how much in money super PACs are putting in super PACs being the way that corporations launder their money into other things. And you look at millions and millions of dollars from super PACs and you don't necessarily need to say, okay, this is, this money is coming from this exact source to know, oh shit, we have a huge problem with the way that moneyed interests in the United States are influencing politics and they are pushing it in the right wing direction. They're doing that yeah. by making the, the democratic party, um, act totally irrationally to their own goals, or at least so it would seem. Um, the party is now at a position of having to self-preserve because if they lose the money, they will lose to the Republicans forever. And that's a disaster. So we need a desperate reform of a massive reform to the way that we, that our politics functions on a foundational level, or else we will never, this is going to, this is going to be a cycle that repeats again and again and again. Um, yeah. it, it's really I, bad. That was kind of where I was getting at where, <clears throat> like I was talking about how the Democrats were trying to purge their own members. I feel like COVID accelerated that, th like the sock Dems in their party were no longer the existential threat. They actually had something to lose because of Trump's policies, mm -hmm. because like high, high ranking Democrats were doing fine under Trump's policies. That's that's a key thing. Yeah. But now his governance was actively harming them, their investors and their PACs. So suddenly they had to win. They yeah. had to win the presidency. And like th that is what I get at where it's it shifted the priorities immediately where it's like I think everyone was kind of jarred by how like it's if, if I say the Democrats mobilized, nobody will believe me in the slightest because yeah. they didn't. But there was very much a case of where like I feel like they ran that campaign very differently uh, with, with more intensity than the primaries really let us believe oh, 100 i mean i was yeah. joking about and, this like lot in real time you can go check my my vods from the time when we were covering like i'm like i like mean joe why why don't we get more mean <laughs> yeah. joe when joe leaned in on the like <clears throat> donald trump is a fucking criminal and now they're trying to go yeah. back on that but i don't think that i don't think that the american people right now are going to let they them won't go accept back. it and that's yeah, my that is something it. that gives me hope is that they won't accept this this milk toast bullshit yeah. because people there's been um so much pain and so much death that it's like oh okay people are not playing nice anymore um they're not gonna and and i don't know maybe they'll succeed for a little while maybe they'll be able to but what it seems like right now this whole idea that like um that like oh joe biden won now we can go back to brunch um i joke about the anti-brunch action all the time i'm actually gonna uh have a a flag up in the background of the anti-brunch action like as a joke that's beautiful it's so funny that is beautiful. but it's true though like it's not selling the normalcy yeah. thing isn't selling because it, it just comes across as unbelievable and and you know what good let joe biden yeah. let joe biden pitch his fucking stupid brunch bullshit to a people as as COVID numbers skyrocket, let him do it. Go for it. I would much prefer if he would just yeah. swing left, but we know that's not going to happen. So go for it. At least be mask off about it. At least go, yes, everybody, we can go back to brunch while literally every brunch place in the country is currently out of business because COVID has completely destroyed our economy. What do you, like, it, it comes off almost jokingly. You know what I mean? Like, it comes off almost like, like a, like a, like a, a cynical joke. Like, it's like, everybody, we can go back to brunch. Look outside. Yeah. Every restaurant in your town is boarded up because literally there's no businesses open anymore. Yeah. It's just like, I, oh, okay, well, I guess we'll get brunch at McDonald's. The only, like, there's only, restaurants are all closed. Everything's yeah. closed I, except for fast food. It's f fucking horrible. And the reason this was bothering me so much is because, like, in the run-up, you had Joe finally giving that kind of, like, that umph attached to it, where it's like, Trump is going to kill people. Trump is the enemy. The Republicans right now have abandoned all of the values they claim to hold. So when he then came out and argued that Trump isn't our enemy, here was my God's honest response, and I want everyone to just repeat this back whenever somebody says this. If Trump wasn't, why, if Trump wasn't your enemy, then why did you run? Right. Yeah. Then why did you run? Yeah, why was it necessary? Why was it necessary to get fucking Biden in instead of yeah. somebody else if Trump isn't the enemy? 
the fact of the matter is that and and i i i oh god i i i hate this but it's like the the liberals were right for the wrong reasons they were right when they say oh donald trump is 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 a fascist donald trump is like the worst thing that's ever happened to america you're correct he's one of the worst presidents that's ever happened to america his his disgusting mismanagement of covid has like led yep. to an uh, is is leading to an unfathomable amount of damage an amount of damage we won't even be able to i i think a decade from now we won't even have an idea of how how yeah. far and how severe it is um like can i depress you for a second just to show you how sure. badly you've managed it yeah today we had 263 covid cases in ireland yep and let me just get you the numbers for right now from us let's see let me just yeah. bring up my little tracker that i have here let's see here today new cases uh let's take a look oh, i can't see it because it's too small here we go new cases today in america 157,000 new cases today today you've doubled our total yes yes it's that bad it is that bad yeah. and it's, it's actually terrifying to like yeah. people cannot grasp the sheer enormity of those numbers and what that is going to look like two weeks from now and I, I've, wow. I've been meaning to talk about this a bit, so this is an opportunity, and uh, thankfully we'll be able to, you know, not focus on it for too long because I really don't <laughs> want people to be do completely doomered. But right now, the U.S. military is in Texas serving as mortuary staff. They had to call in the military to be volunteer, not volunteer, obviously, because they're soldiers, but essentially to be stand-in mortuary staff. That's what that's the state that we're in in some of our worst states. It's horrible. The case, the state of America right now is is unfathomably bad. This is back breakingly bad for this country. And the good news is, is that we will make it out the other end and everyone is not going to die. Um, the bad news is that it's going to be very scary and very unstable yeah. for a long time and i don't know how long this will um these echoes are going to last probably a very long time but the good news is is that from that hopefully we can actually learn we don't have a choice about what happened whether covid was uh the only thing that saved america or not regardless the fact of the matter is it happened and now our job is to make the most of it going forward make the best with what we have going forward um yeah it is actually the mismanagement is worse than anybody could have predicted it's worse than the than the most severe predictions that we've that we've had um interestingly um thankfully one good thing has come out of the biden administration and that's that they put the 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 guy michael osterheim the guy who I literally brought, I had like, I did a section on him. He was on Majority Report. He was on Joe Rogan's show um, about to talk about this guy is like the one of the most foremost experts in the world on COVID numbers. And he and everybody was okay. people were calling him like, oh, you're so alarmist because he was saying like, no, your predictions are way too low for how bad this could be. <clears throat> that guy is going to be in charge of the COVID response going, you know, once Lovely. Biden's in office. So that's good. One good thing we can look at from Biden is that they're going to yeah. put somebody who's actually knows what the fuck he's doing in position there. Um, but what we, what the whole thing is, we're in the worst of it that we've seen right now, and that's not going to stop when Joe Biden comes in. That is going to be all yeah. under lame duck Trump. Trump is not doing shit. The only thing Trump is doing right now is focusing on the ego of his victory of massaging his base and filtering people into OANN and Newsmax and all these other far right groups. That's all he's doing. He's not fucking caring at all. Yeah. They're, they're doing nothing about COVID right now. And it's worse than it's ever been by like a long shot. You know, I show people all the time the chart just like looking at like this is a spike Un un yeah. unlike we could have even imagined it's it's not even double the last big spike when that one was was double the first one this is like triple the last triple, one which was double yeah. the first one and it's the crazy. first one was miserable it's actually horrifying i mean how many fatal cases are we at now we're at 261,000 phase fatal cases in the united states a day no no that's that's fatal total we're at new okay. cases new cases per day has waffled between uh, has waffled between 
150,000 new cases. Fatal cases were at 261,000 total, which were at about 1,000 a day. About 1,000 Americans are dying from COVID every single day. Yeah. Now, like six with people these numbers, that is going to spike terrifyingly in about two weeks. Yeah. Like, we don't even know what those numbers... We might be looking at two, 3,000 people a day dying from COVID, which is absurd. 9-11 a, a, a yeah. every day is... is, is it's horrifying. So yeah, yeah, without, again, without over fixating on the most terrifying bullshit that's on the horizon, it's hard to not talk about this because everyone's so exhausted about it. And yet it's still going on. It's still fucking going on. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Cause what I would suggest people do is to be looking forward and to be looking to the future as a means to be dealing with the present, because like, um, I, 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 I'm trying not to be doomer and to inspire, inspire more doomerism because one of the things that I feel like a lot of people aren't talking about as well as it's something President Sunday said in my chat that I've even thought about myself was like, we're seeing the effects of long COVID where a decade from now, two decades from now, um, social security is going to become a lot more important because we're going to see the long-term health of uh, people becoming very affected. And the US is going to be indelibly changed because of the sheer amount of people who've had it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't know the long-term effects on just the physiology of people. Oh, um, and like, especially because like, like disproportionately, it's been your African, -American, it's been your black community that's been affected. So they're probably going to even be in worse socioeconomic conditions because of like inability to work because of like being overworked and like having, not having the energy energy because like one of the things about long COVID is that like it scars your lungs and your um and your heart so you just you you can't put in that extra hour and like what is it? in the US like your average work week is expected to be 60 hours mm -hmm. and then you're expected to put in like an extra 10 or you get fired but it's um like we we have to look forward to those mutual aid structures of trying to like provide structures and incentive structures so that we can help each other in kind of like almost like that modern community mindset towards helping people enrich the experience of the base game so that we can enrich our experience as communal societies so that we can then as communities and kind of like as states as cities as um like just groups together we can try help each other because we're going to need to mm -hmm. and I, i'm i'm going to give you the unenviable unenviable task of like emotionally rehabilitating your audience because i need to go to the bathroom oh, yeah, and just no to because like covid is a a horrible conversation but it's an important conversation and what's even more important and like i feel like we've done this as well as like it's important to talk responsibly about it so that we don't leave people panicked oh because absolutely. that's the worst thing you can do yeah and, um, and i i promise you i can i think i can do that just that for both your <laughs> chat and mine don't you worry not about it my friend i mean my specialty seconds. <laughs> Bloomer fuel. All right. So here's the thing. Uh, yeah, it's looking fucking grim, everybody. It's not looking good. But guess what? There's going to be a world on the other side of it. And um, the fact of the matter is, if you take precautions, you're probably going to be relatively safe. Um, even if you get COVID, it's okay. Life does not end just because you get COVID necessarily. Um, I'm pretty sure you will, Martini Peterson. The Statistically, the chances are are pretty low that it's going to get you. There is just, we're talking about massive, massive, massive statistics, you know, and it's hard to, to grasp all of that. Um, but the fact of the matter is, going forward, this is not, we don't live in the same world that we used to. We really, really, really don't live in the same world that we used to. Um... Yeah, permanent lung damage does not sound like happy times. Oh, Couchy, it's been really good. Uh, um, yeah, it's it's been a really good day. Even though um, even though we're talking about a grim topic at the moment, it's been a very good day. We have a lot of fun stuff in front of us. Um, but yeah, we're going to have to grapple with the fact that American work culture is literally physically not viable. It cannot happen the way that it used to. You cannot be pushing people at 40-hour weeks. We don't have the same economy that we used to. The world changed that for us. Um, and what we're having to learn now is how do we survive? How do we take care of one another going forward? And what that means is that um, the world going forward is going to be greatly shaped by our values, by the things that we actually value. So if we value 
survival, if we value creativity, if we value art, those are the sorts of things. If we value caring for one another, if we value looking out for people who maybe aren't in perfect health, um, those are the things we have to instill into the world that we're building now. What we have to recognize is that we are in a post-apocalypse that or well we're in the apocalypse the world after this is going to be a form of post-apocalyptic world it's not going to look like mad max it's not going to look like a fictionalized version but we're going to have to build a totally new world and while that's scary there's also some exciting things about that and we are given the opportunity to build things in a better way than they were before um and that's what we're gonna do yeah look up the definition of apocalypse it's not as extreme as you'd think. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a cataclysmic event. We have survived, you know, in a way, if we're going to tie it back to the, if we're going to tie it back to the world of Warcraft, yeah, it's a boring apocalypse. We do live in a Hello, hello, I'm back. Hey, I was just telling people that, yes, we have survived, you know, we, we are currently surviving through a cataclysmic event, a genuine cataclysm, especially um, here um, in, in the United States. And there's a lot of bad things with that. But the world is going to keep going on afterwards. Afterwards, the world is not literally going to be utterly destroyed. Um, this is the cataclysm. This is uh, Deathwing going through and burning everything up. <laughs> but what that means is that we, that our values and how we choose to build afterwards, are going to be doubly important. So think about the things that as this changes, as the world continues to change, what things really matter to you, the type of world that you want to live in, and we build towards that together and the fact of the matter is there is an opportunity here for us to build better so that this sort of shit doesn't happen again um it's not a fun apocalypse it's a boring apocalypse it's true yeah. however the uh, world that follows from it does not have to be a boring world it does not have to be a world that's completely focused on gathering money um you know we could do this. We could yeah. actually make something better out of all of this. And we're going to have to build something. That's the fact yeah. of the matter. Like right now, the fact this is we are there is the normal's not coming back. No matter how much Joe Biden and, and Rachel Maddow, Maddow and whatever want to say that normal isn't is going to come back. It won't. It cannot. It cannot come back. What was there is gone. It was destroyed. Those businesses are gone. Nobody's doing them anymore. The money has been ferreted away. We have to build yeah. new. It's going to be new shit. So there's it's some... It's exposed the incentive structures are based not towards providing for people, but providing favorable conditions to make money. The I put it on Twitter earlier, but the way I described it was COVID has exposed the way capitalist governance prioritizes society. And it can be summed up in the phrase of... Um, if we have to let the cogs rust to keep the machine going, so be it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and, and uh, you're not the machine in this equation. Yeah. <laughs> it this is the this is the the IWW uh building building the new society in the bones of the old one situation. That's literally yeah. where we're at right now. COVID has yeah. totally upturned um you know to COVID has completely upturned um the world but here's the thing <laughs> somebody in chat says i can't be a socialist and eat eggs benedict well here's the thing we're talking about ideological brunch not real brunch here's the cool thing if brunch is super important to you why don't we build a world where everybody gets to have brunch because workers in the future get to have fucking multiple lunch breaks or multiple meal breaks instead of having to work like fucking slaves all day every day we can actually build a world where eggs eating food with your family or eating food with your loved ones if you don't have like a family a blood family is super important again we can build a future where it's normal to take a long lunch at at your workplace to take two hours for lunch we can build a world that's like that that's the opportunity that we have in front of us we just have to figure out how to do it and once once we recognize that like oh the normal's gone now we have to choose what we're going to build and how we're actually going to do that. And it becomes a equation of strategy as opposed to despair. So yeah, maybe, maybe that's possible. If you like your eggs, Benedict, make it a part of your vision of the future. Seriously. So yeah. yeah. And the, to respond seriously to a joke question, the way that I've said it from day one is the, the issue is not with you eating at a certain time. The issue is with that somehow 
um, having something to do with <clears throat> your inherent value as a human being. That, that's, that's the issue. Um, it, it shouldn't be an indicator of your socioeconomic value. That's, that's the issue. Um, like, if you want to eat brunch, work away, have at it. Um, it just shouldn't say anything more than you were hungry at that time. Yeah. Um, and, and, and like in that, uh, some, uh, in chat, there's been a, a comment from stare blankly ahead. I hate to be the doomer, but I think we won't be rebuilding so much as big companies will, um, expand and conquer. Well, they're, they'll attempt to, but they're not like big companies are, here's the Into thing. what markets? What's that? Yeah. But, but there's, okay. Into so what markets? Big companies have a lot of money, but there is a competency lack. And there is also a, they aren't gods. They just can throw money at a lot of stuff, which does give them a, a lot of influence, but you can like, like, but we can choose how we ch interact with that. They can't literally um, take over a town very easily. I do agree that corporate expansion is, is, is likely a huge problem. And because they have money that can serve as an incentive, it's something we're going to have to contend with. But guess what? You don't have to follow all of their rules. That's the thing. Um, people can say, no, I'm not going to take a corporate sponsorship. No, I'm not going to fucking peddle advertisements. No, I'm not going to fucking do this. We can choose to build separately. We can, um, you know, we can choose to do things differently. And also, they do have a competency crisis. Um, corporations spend, spend, spend yeah. as fast as they can. And they don't have the same ability, like, just by the very nature of how um how you build skills of how you actually cultivate sustainable um structures corporations aren't really good at building sustainable structures they rush they want that money immediately and that mentality is what got us here in the first place it's in it's inherently self-defeating to a certain degree so yeah, yeah all i'm saying like is is that they're not <clears throat> all powerful they're very powerful they're very dangerous in certain ways but they have their weaknesses and we can exploit those absolutely yeah the one hundred percent, yeah. Um, I'm I'm at the beginning of my econ education, so I just don't have much to add, other than the main. Like what I was saying earlier, the, like that you're seeing the cracks in the U.S. empire. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's tempting to kind of like relive the old glory of the past from the capitalist perspective, kind of like oh, sure, we can just make corporations and just make money, but it's like th there's no markets, there's really no markets left to explore and exploit at the moment because a lot of what was like like the former third world is industrializing, and like um like China is moving its industrial base into Africa and moving towards a service economy. So you're now suddenly like made in China is going to be a thing of the past. So a lot of these markets are just not available. The the labor pool is drying up. Um, we could see it massively increase in Africa. But one of the things that um China's involvement in Africa is doing is turning that African industry away from the US. So what markets are those US companies going to turn towards? It's not going to be that simple. So that's going to create different incentive structures. So like exactly like you said, you have to exploit those weaknesses. Yeah. And we also have another problem, which is that like, this is the, uh, this was discussed um, in, uh, in, you know, there's 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 theory about this. Uh, in in fact, um, uh, in Reform versus Revolution, um, Rosa Luxemburg dis discusses how um, the like not having a like a frontier on which to expand empire um, is a huge yeah. problem for capitalism. It's a mathematic. It's a ma it's a problem of mathematics. Not even just it, you could take the morality out of it. Obviously, it's horrifically disgusting. Like the way that empire expands, but it's a mathematical problem. Once you don't have new countries to conquer, the earth is a limited space. And once um once you run out of places to conquer and subjugate and exploit, you either have to try and make another place exploitable and conquerable which is not as easy as it seems because those places can also arm themselves and fight back and it, there's a cost yeah. to those sorts of things or you need to change your system because just so you know um space uh space colonization is not anywhere close we're nowhere close and yeah. also planets don't have life on them they don't have exploitable labor that we can uh conquer uh, anywhere near us that we're even close so we have a really quickly approaching problem of falling rates of profit um crashing up against the lack of places to exploit 
We have to change the system. There's no other choice. The system has to be changed or we're going to, or it just will stop working. And if it stops working, well, then humanity stops working. And if we don't want humanity to stop working, well, then we got to change the system. One option. So yeah, yeah. Um, automation is a, is a thing, but the problem with automation is that you still have a problem. You still have a problem with automation, which is that, um, yeah, automation could create um, endlessly exploitable like automaton la labor that doesn't complain, that doesn't have knowledge or feelings or anything like that. But who are you going to sell those? Who are those things made for? 10 people? Yeah. Are you going to have a society yeah. of 10 people that like, yeah. Yeah, this is one thing that's very important as well that I think people need to get. It's like, the, if you were to fully automate your society, it's no longer capitalism, it's something else because the mode of production has fundamentally changed. Yep. Um, like, it's something else. And I'd argue something so much worse because be. you no longer have access to a human labor pool. So there is no longer an incentive for the ruling class to provide the toppings towards um, the lower classes. Like, like one of the only good things about capitalism is because they require that labor to exploit, there is an incentive for them to provide you a wage. They have to provide you that wage. There's one of the incentives. Fully automization removes that incentive, so they'll stop paying you all together. So it's something fundamentally worse. Well, uh, I, but here's I, the I think other people side need to get that. that sometimes. Here's the other side yeah. of that, though, which is that by removing, uh, by removing the incentive to care for the laborers, what are they going to do? A die-off? Like, are they going to just kill everyone? Well, maybe. Maybe that's going to happen. But again, then you run into the, uh, the problem of that people don't like to die. I know it might come yeah. as a surprise, but people really don't like to die. Um, people will do very, very, very drastic things if you make them, if you try to make them die. In fact, they might make you die instead. And so that's the gambit is that if people are just going to try and force a world of automation like this, which they can't do, by the way, the, the claims yeah, they're not of these automation yet. fucking grifters like Elon Musk and all this who are saying, oh, we could do this or that overnight. They can't do shit. They're fucking idiots. They've lied about everything. Just just go watch my stream about the Zoom food. And I, boy, do I boy do I got something to sell you if you think automation is going to be the, the if, if the Elon Musk's of this world are going to fix everything um, overnight. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I have faith I in Elon's employees. I've no faith in Elon. Oh, sure. But those employees. But again, the automation yeah. can only happen because of the employees <laughs> and those employees, unless they're unless you think that people who can invent robotics technology are like stupid people. You know what I mean? They're going to realize, hey, wait oh, yeah. a second. Like and also those people don't aren't all monsters because they're they're not all like as as removed as somebody like Elon Musk. These are people who are paid like comparatively piddling wages compared to the people above them. They can become aware of their class as well and recognize, yeah. wait a minute, I'm not going to help you automate all of the people that I love to death. Fuck you. I'll 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 do something yeah. else. So that's the thing. There's while I I think that like I think there is a a a tendency to black pill about automation but the fact of the matter is that automation takes time to implement and people get really mad after only a few days of not living a very good life three days yeah. of not having a nice meal you're gonna fucking throw a brick through a window and the fact of the matter is that if you have millions of people who are hungry for a couple days you're gonna have a lot of problems on your hand really quickly and unless you have an army of terminators to immediately go out <laughs> on the road and kill everyone on the planet leaving only you know 20 people left well okay there's a there's there's gonna have to be a societal change so that's the thing yeah um uh yeah um yes nuts zanzi is an irish republican um <coughs> yeah an irish republican socialist not 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 an american republican um so yeah uh, I'm an actual an Republican. Yeah, an actual Republican. Um, so I got about 15 more minutes uh, before I got to go do my my segment before my panel that I'm on tonight. Um, oh, lovely. I hope, I what, hope... what are the topics, actually? I'm oh, curious. Now. Uh, the first topic is we're going to be discussing uh, various angles on the uh, Afro Puffs slash Space Puffs discourse first. I don't know if you've heard about that. Um, nope. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a... An, it's kind of a niche issue. Basically, Nintendo um, put in a hairstyle that's traditionally been known as Astro Puffs, uh, Af Astro Puffs, Afro Puffs, and they renamed it Space Puffs 
um, which people are talking about cultural appropriation and with regards to that erasure, stuff like that, because it's traditionally yeah. African-American hairstyle. Um, and so we're going to talk about that first. Then the second topic is going to be um, sexual sexualization on streaming platforms and how women are pressured um, to sexualize in order to succeed with their channel, whether it's possible to succeed without sexualization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the third topic is um, discussing um, women's uh, women's employment issues in the United States under COVID, um, because it's a statistical fact that women tend to work um, work people jobs, and people jobs right now are the most dangerous because this is a disease that spreads yeah. from people to other people. Um, yeah. So um, yeah. So those are the topics that we're going to be talking about. It's going to be really interesting, and I, I think uh, I think I'll be able to offer some unique perspectives on these, um, which will be really really amazing. So far, every attendance I've had on Prime's uh, Amazon Lily Pride uh, Femme Presenting Only po podcast has been really really good. It's been a great experience. So I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I, um, I've been told I should reach out to Prime's and just say, hey, can I have a go? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, you should. Oh, yeah, if you've not been on Prime Show, you should absolutely, like, let them know because they're always looking for more people and they do, like, three panels a week. Um, so, yeah. yeah I, I think I've been on three panels in total. Yeah, oh, you should. You should absolutely do it. Panels are, are a great way to grow your channel and I feel they're like you'd fun. have a really good time. Yeah, you'd have a good time. They're fun. They're fun yeah. as fuck. Um, yeah. And I, I'll, I'll, ver I'll, sorry, go on. Oh, no, I just want to address nuts. No, Irish Irish Republicans are not right-wingers. They are very far from right-wingers. They are oh, they're pretty oh, do, left. Oh, do I have a conversation for you, my friend? <laughs> <laughs> Irish Republicanism was basically built on the idea that um, landowners have no right to dictate the commons of a place, and it should be governed by the will of the collective society in which inhabits that place. Republicanism is the, Republicanism is the idea that that a place should not be private property. That is what republicanism is. It's left wing. Yes. It's so, inherently anti-monarchy. Yeah, um, it's, <laughs> it's like, never forget where republicanism came from. Like republicanism in the US, it, it's, there's a theorist, a syndicalist called James Connolly who described it in the most beautiful way possible. He said that the aborted um, republican movement in the United States, because it started off anti-monarchy and then, well, today you have them a monarchist party, like you've said. The Republicans in um, America are yeah, a monarchist it's, party. Sick. It's disgusting. Um, our, Ireland's politics is really fun because um, it, it, I say it's fun. It's fucking horribly depressing. But like the right wing for love nor money can't grip us because we don't have an imagined glorif glorified past. We were colonized for nearly 800 years, for God's sake. We very recently gained our independence and we gained our independence from liberals co-opting a left wing struggle. So what does the right have to grip here? We don't have an alt right. We have a struggling right wing movement here. They just they can't get a grip in ireland however we're in the grips grips of fucking neoliberalism um so there's a lot of work to be done but um a left-wing revolution is more likely than a right-wing revolution here so that's that's a good thing yeah yeah <laughs> yeah um yes, can i give you a very quick that. anecdote for please do please do the, uh for this for the second topic i'll give you a very quick anecdote that's in the irish news at the moment there's there's a school in a county called Cavan in Ireland. Um, they sent around a letter to all of the um, female students asking them to no longer wear fitting uh, clothing because it was distracting the male uh, students and the male teachers. Nice. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So at all levels common. of society, there seems to be this idea that women are responsible for the um, attention they generate. Mm -hmm. Um funny response all of the boys in the school decided to turn up in um uh, are like they're going to go to school tomorrow wearing tights and leggings and things like that is basically a form of solidarity protest Amazing. but um, i just thought it, it might be a nice anecdote to throw out there we're like that what we see on twitch isn't a twitch problem it's just a social problem invading twitch yeah and i, I do think that i think there are there are sort of catalysts on twitch that make it worse because of course twitch is a very visual medium <coughs> um meaning oh, yeah. that like of course that's it's going to enhance the, the the pressure on that particular front but i don't think it's like like twitch was built with this in mind it's just a a magnifier of pre-existing societal issues um and um yeah so i have a lot to say about it uh anybody who's interested in that sort of thing um i'm doing a very long stream today so we're going to be 
in about whatever, in about like 10 minutes or whatever, uh, I'm going to be going to do a little bit of in interim content that everyone's been a little hyped for, which is going to be fun. Um, and then I'm going to be going on to that panel. And then afterwards, I'm going to be discussing the panel, um, having questions or whatever. Um, and yeah, so yeah, that's my little plug for that stuff. Uh, it's a really great panel. Um, my last experience on it was amazing. We were talking about, um, the last time I was on the Amazon Lily, um, podcast or whatever round table or whatever it's called, um, the, uh, we discussed, um, we discussed, uh, people like, like how prevalent it is for, um, Twitch panels to be extremely gender skewed. Like for example, um, you know, most Twitch panels are one or two women or one or two femme presenting people and like six to eight mask presenting people. It's really okay. slanted. And this results in, and, and there's a joke among my community um, that every single time, every single panel that I've been on, um, I get told that I talk too much. Even though I might be the only woman on the panel, I might never actually talk all that much. I get told this every single time by a guy. Um, and it's like become a joke in my community that people bring it up every time it happens. And we just like emote the shit out of it because it happens so fucking frequently. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, Whenever I watch your panels, I notice that happening. And I'm just kind of sad. Like it's, I, I'm not going to lie. I have genuinely, been, like one of the things that annoys me is when people do that, where it's kind of like, hey, you haven't been talking. I actually want to start going and start timing panels. Yeah. Um, you know, if you were yeah. to do that, it would be fascinating <clears throat> because like, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm way too distractible when I'm on a panel to time my own time. Um, but it's like, but I've been challenged on it multiple times and I'm just like, do it then, then time me, then tell me I did. And if I did, I'll, I'll apologize for talking 10 seconds more than you. But uh, there have been other times where, like, for example, I had a conversation with Rob Knorr where he accused me of the same thing. And then Dylan in, in, in instituted a timer. And previous to that, we I've rewatched the VOD multiple times. He talked way more than me. Yeah. But once the timer was introduced, you can't really use that <laughs> argument anymore. Um, yeah, yeah, it really is like that. And it's not just me either. Again, every single woman who is on that panel... Um, every single femme presenting person on that panel had the, has had the same exact experience. It really is ingrained. Um, and it's to the degree where like, um, not, yeah, it's just absolutely wild. I've watched, I've gone and looked at the comments of videos. Um, and, and women can't win on these platforms. Yeah. You can't because I've seen, I've literally, I, I went through, um, one of the prime Kai's, like it wasn't one of the women's ones. It was one of the just random ones. And there were two types of comments that I saw about the only woman who was on the panel. And it was like woman on the panel. She, every time she spoke up, it was so motherfucking stupid. And then the other one was like, why the fuck is, is she even there? She barely talked. You can't win. If you, you yeah. you're damned, if you do, and you're damned, if you don't. And that is actually a huge problem that is prevalent on, uh, it is another, again, it's another societal issue as a whole. Like this has been researched pretty extensively. Um, that like people, well, they over, they rate, um, how long women talk considerably longer than they actually did. And they rate men less having talked less than they like actually did. So it's a double down feature. It's, it's actually very fucked. Like it basically I, when women talk up, it's like, oh, you've been talking and nagging forever. And I get that all. I've the read very shit. similar studies. Yeah. Uh, another one of them is that like, um, if a, if a man was to say something and a woman was to say something, um, audiences are more likely to recall the man saying it and then mm -hmm. presume that he had said it first. Yep. It's really bad. And it's something that I, uh, fight against all the time. It makes people really mad. In fact, one of the most, um, one of the funniest conversations I've ever been involved in my debate with fanatic, um, which was hilarious, um, uh, was completely based off of that because, uh, he told me I talked too much and, uh, I said, uh, I was like, yeah, nice, uh, nice sexist trope, my dude. And then he had a meltdown over me just saying, oh, nice sexist trope, my dude, complete meltdown said I was calling him sex, that I was discriminating against him, all this kind of shit because of that. Even though he just told me that I talk too much, and I'm like, yeah, yeah okay, yeah. Can, can can I let you go with something really funny now, yeah, just yeah, on that topic? Um, a friend of mine, um, she's starting to kind of like branch out amongst her friends in England on um Snapchat. Mm -hmm. Um, she's bisexual and she's kind of involved in the LGBT community. She did a Q and A, and somebody came in and asked, "Why is she being heterophobic?" For being bis for being bisexual. 
Yeah. Oh, and and amazing. my my response to that question was how badly do you need do you like how badly do you want to be oppressed? Yeah, yeah. And that's some validation, I guess. Because this is the thing about the right wing that's absolutely hilarious. They constantly talk about the victim complex and the victim narrative of people on the left. They need to be persecuted. It's like their worldview falls apart if they're not being persecuted. Yeah, it's <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, look at just the way like even it's 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 the one of the best ways of seeing this is just looking at Donald Trump and how much he yeah. literally all, all he does when he's in public is whine about I've been treated so poorly by the by the the bad media, the enemies of the people. I call them the enemy of the people because they treat me so bad. All he does is whine. All he does the fucking yeah. war on Christmas shit that's been going on for like 20 years where every single yeah. Christmas season the Republicans go wild about how eh, everybody's trying to delete Christmas. It's like, oh, oh my fucking God. You you, yeah. you have a, a complex about being the most persecuted person on the planet. And it's like... Yeah, I know, it's crazy. It's so it's such projection. They're like, oh, it's a oppression Olympics on the left. It's like, no, what, you, what you're calling oppression Olympics is people very on a very nuanced manner discussing the issues that they're dealing with ba based on their identity and you call that oppression olympics meanwhile you're talking about how conservatives on on college campuses are the most discriminated against people on the planet there's a persecution campaign against christians it's like a, the, the, the the dominant religion like there's a persecution like yeah campaign against them. it's so ridiculous but and, yeah and here's the thing if we're going to talk about oppression olympics never forget you still have to qualify for the olympics true true yeah it's that's so good it's it's not it, it's not a free for all it's invite only yep. uh my, my friend i've loved having you on if you'd like to just give a shout out let people know where they can find you absolutely and if you have any projects coming up soon that they can catch you on yeah um i've got a lot of stuff going on actually um <laughs> so of course i'm going on the panel tonight um that's going to be in like an hour or two approximately um and uh, i don't know there's usually a little bit of a delay on those things as people filter in and whatnot um yeah. you can follow me the easiest way to find all of my links is at demon mom Excuse me. Of course, I have a hiccup. Uh, demonmama.com. If you go to demonmama, M-A-M-A, -M -A, so mama, dot com, um, the easiest way to find all of my content, basically my Twitch, my YouTube, my Twitter is all there. Right now I'm streaming on YouTube. I've been streaming on YouTube. But the cool thing is it all goes to my site. Whether I'm on Twitch or whether I'm on YouTube, all of it goes right to my site. So you can actually watch right on my site. The easiest way to get notifications is through my Discord. Also, you get the benefit of hanging out in one of the coolest communities if i don't say so myself on the entire internet um we have a lot of fun so i would love to have you would love to hang around with you um and yeah that's that's my stuff um and uh zanzi we've been posting your stuff all in my chat but if you'd like to plug oh, yourself cheers. in my chat that'd be awesome <clears throat> Uh, my name is Zanzi. I'm an Irish Republican socialist. I like looking at mainly like I'm an old school philosophy, bro. I mean, I'm what, what you call a theory nerd. What I like to do is I like to read books that nobody likes reading anymore and trying to apply it into a contemporary context to figure out what do the conditions look like right now and what do we do about it? And then pass that information on over to good people like yourself so that you can then rhetorically convince the masses that we actually have plans, we have methods, we have approaches and we actually have a we know what we're doing and we want to do something because one of the common critiques of the left is that we just want to tear things down no we don't what we want to do is we want to build things we actually want to make things so if you're interested in that kind of content you can come on over um if you're not interested in that kind of content i also speed run i'm after this i'm going to be trying to play dino crisis very very fast um that's another thing i like doing so if you want to catch any of that pop on over you can catch me on youtube i'm active on twitter a lot but However, Twitter is a monologue space for me. Twitch is where I do my streaming and you catch my videos on YouTube. Um, thanks a million for hosting me, Diva Mama. I yeah. always enjoy popping on. And, and thank you for having me on your show. It's been really wonderful. I, every time I have a conversation with you, I walk away feeling very happy. Um, we always have great conversations. So thank you so oh, much yeah. for uh, for sitting down with me and, and poking my brain in, in interesting ways because you're very good at that. So... I'm not a bother. And, and I just have to laugh that we had a conversation and we never touched on religion. Yeah, we didn't. Oh, my God. That's, never, didn't that's never happened that's before. That's never happened. Every other one, we always end up talking about religion. But, hey, I'm glad yeah. we got to talk about World of Warcraft and mutual aid. It was there fucking we go, yeah. great. So, 
Thank yeah. you so much, Zanzi, and I'll, I'll talk to you Not soon. Not a bother. I'll talk to you soon, my friend. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Yay! That was so good! See? Zanzi's great. 